Welcome everyone to this week's Force Friday. Uh, today we're going to be looking at your guys' work, uh, trying to give you as much uh, input as we possibly can to try and help you learn how to draw with Force better, right? So um, I'm just going to get to it. Uh, I have what, so no Murtunji today. Murtunji is not feeling well. It's going to be Swanley and I that will be carrying forward the, um, the conversation today. Um, we have work from yours that went into our Dropbox. Uh, we're going to be going over that work. Um, I'm going to probably hit a little bit on everything, meaning force, form, and shape. I don't know about anatomy. We'll see if we get that far. Um, I'm just going to take a look at, like I said, a handful of drawings and show you some tricks as to, A, how to assess, you know, how to find your mistakes, right? And during the critique, how to find your mistakes, and then obviously how to fix them, because finding them is one thing, but fixing them is another. And just to make, just state the obvious, you can't fix what you can't find, right? So let's see if I can try to help you look through your work and go, how do I, how do I discover this in the first place, right? So uh, with that, um, how you doing, Swanley? <laughs> yeah, good. Excited for the session as always. You know, it's yeah. always great to help you guys out there improving your work. Yeah, I love doing critiques. You know, actually, I could do this every darn week. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I mean, this is what you and I do every week as it is, right? It's our job. So, yeah. Um, in a way, you guys are getting a little taste. Those of you that are here today, you're getting a taste of what Swanley and I do week in and week out and in, uh, in mentoring and what I do with the premium members as well is get in artwork and have conversations and tell people what they need to work on and just keep helping them improve. All right, so let's get to it. Um, take our time and I wanna really see if I can help you guys understand how to find the issues, right? So uh, the first few are from a, an artist named Axel. Let's take a work, look at Axel's drawings. I didn't grab all of Axel's. Um, you sent in a, a ton of works, I cherry picked basically through them just to see what grabbed my attention. Um, some pretty good stuff going on here. I think at the core of trying to draw with force, you know, is do you have a, a sense of force at all in the first place? And I would say, when I look at these drawings, they have, a, you know, what do I mean by force, right? So. To me, in order for there to be some sense of force, there's some sense of movement, you know? Movement, um, energy. I'll try to slow down, otherwise my writing looks like my drawing. <laughs> um, yeah, some sense of movement and energy, right? So hopefully all of you out there in the audience, you know, you can see in Axel's drawings, it, I, I feel this, I feel that you understand this energy, right? There's a sense of, um, pushing to the right with this pose. And in the legs, um, it seems like this leg starts to want to go this way. And then right here, right at the knee is where I'm like, I don't know what's happening anymore, right? It gets lost. On this side, when it comes to shape, remember, you don't want to draw symmetrical shapes like so. So this is a symmetrical shape. The reason is asymmetry is what drives fluidity through the different parts of the body. And uh, this is asymmetrical shape, this leg. So this leg stops basically at the hip, like we, you know, or at the knee, you could say, if you want to even squeeze your way in here, it would stop here, right? So to me, both of the legs stop at the knee. Torso has some movement. It feels like it's pushing to the right. Um, how is it doing that, right? Like, why can we all look at that and go, yeah, it does feel like it's pushing to the right? Well, because at the simplest level, um, Axel's got this, you know, big curve going down the right, right side of the body. And he's kind of working his way a little bit into the pelvis like this. The curve over here is a little smaller. This one is like the longer one. There's not too much of an indent here. The indent's bigger here. So because this curve is here, it feels like there's stuff pushing against it. So at the simplest abstract, level, um, what we're learning is, you know, if I have a line that's curved like this, its apex makes my brain think that energy is being pushed in a direction, right? So I want to use that, you know, for those of you that know about force drawing, this is called applied force, right? Applied force is pushing on the inside of this torso and it's pushing us out there. So 
some good stuff going on, some sense of movement, pretty good start, right? So how do we fix this? The main issue were the legs. The torso is actually working relatively well. Um, so on the legs, I don't have the reference, right? So I'm going to take some educated guesses here. But typically, if I could see the inside of the knee, uh, chances are I need to draw it. So this would have been outside thigh, inside knee, outside calf, down to the foot. It would have been something more like this. And I would really want to feel and understand those, those rhythms. This guy, more challenging. Um, first of all, if I were to go for shape, I would want force on the top and into the knee, and I would straighten out the bottom. So the shape can more clearly drive force over the top. Straight lines, everyone, to me, a straight line equals like zero force. It's neutral, right? And that neutrality um, helps define a structure. It's like, it's almost like you had a, a, a water balloon, right? If you put the water balloon on a table surface, the table is the zero force. It's, you know, a flat straight line, but the blob of the water balloon is pushing up, right? Like, you know, here's a table and now I put this water balloon on top of it, right? So it's something like this. So nothing going on here. It's all pushing outward, you see? And then if, imagine if I shoved my hand on it here. So here's my hand, right? Now all of a sudden this would like blob out this way, you see? So, oh, that's applied force, right? I'm pushing down here. Notice where the apex is. It starts wanting to push out that way, you see? So that's kind of what's going on. So the straight line is like this moment of uh, rigidity. It's a zero. It starts structuring it out. And where the peak of the curve in the water balloon is, is where the most applied force is going on. Directional force is just the actual contour itself, right? Here it's saying, well, we've got to go through this curve, right? We're going to come from here and here, and we're pushing through this curve, and we're pushing out, right? And we've got this straight line of rigidity that that water balloon is pushing against, right? So when I look at this leg, to me, the water balloon, the table is here, the balloon is the leg, right? And it's trying to make its way to the lower leg. So the shape kind of is down here, trying to push its way out to the next place in the body. So the big question, which I can't answer 100% here because I don't have the photo, is as I come down here, is this a front to front, which means it goes front of thigh, front of shin like that, which is my guess. My guess is it's doing that. And the reason I would say that is because the body is leaning this way and I think the stress is on the front of the shin. Um, or it could be uh, front of the thigh and then the back of the calf. The further forward this foot is, well, that one's interesting. The further forward the foot is, <laughs> um, the further forward the foot is, the more opportunity there is to say the force is coming from the back of the calf, right? Because then the rhythm is going like this and into this, and it's driving the foot forward, right? So the energy comes from the back. When we want to drive the energy um, backward from the knee, I'm measuring off the knee basically. So if the ankle is here and the knee is here, I'm driving that way, right? Then normally it goes from front to back. If I'm going from the front of the thigh, I want to drive the foot that way. And usually I'm in the front of the shin, pushing to the back of the heel, you see? And that's what I think is gonna go on here. Okay, torso, like I said, pretty good. Good line, good fluidity, it's a pretty good idea. So this is what I would call a C torso, by the way. And then in the arms, you wanna get out to the shoulder. Shoulder is the detour or connector from the torso out into the arm. So from the shoulder, I drop down to the arm, to the elbow, and then the elbow up to whatever the hand is doing. And then over here, I want to drive into this shoulder, and then the arm is here. Watch this. Notice here, you're curving against the bone. You want to stay on that elbow side where the ulna is. All right, so this is probably curving this way. And then my guess is maybe you like this arc because the wrist is bending downward. So I would say it's this to this. And so your rhythm is here. Rhythm occurs when there's a flip, right? It goes like this to this, that's one rhythm. This is not a rhythm from here to here. It's really just one long idea of force. At the wrist, there's a flip in the curve. That's the rhythmic moment, right? So that's it for this first one, right? We talked about shape, we talked about legs. We I gave you some tricks on 
going to the front of the shin or the back. Um, talked about the arms, rhythm, flipping, right? Deltoids, a lot of different things. We talked about this water balloon concept, right? Lots of different things going on. So hopefully that helped. I have a couple of axles. So let's take a look at the next one. Okay. <clears throat> So, you know, when I look at drawings, depending on what place in a student's education they're in, where are they on the path, the three main categories are force, uh, form, and then shape, and then anatomy thereafter, okay? Um, so let's say that Axel and I were up to that place. I would look at force and make sure it's working. So. To me, the first thing is what's going on in the torso. You know, can we clarify what it's doing? It doesn't even need to have to exaggerate. It's just trying to get more clearly an understanding. Um, and to draw that understanding, and it's okay to draw it, because my goal here with you is not to create an illustration. I'm trying to teach you how to draw, okay? Some students, if they're with me long enough, sure, we actually do, do get to a place where we have conversations about style and where do you want things to go, right? Uh, in this case, I would say I want to push into this shoulder from this side of the body. Almost the same as the last pose we just looked at. So see torso, but I draw it, you know, draw the concept. And so it's like, okay, I want to go from here to here. I'm going to push into this shoulder. Now, I don't know if this is drawn from reference or not. One thing that hurts force is when you're drawing a straight line, right? We just had a conversation around the straight line. Uh, zero. Straight lines can happen not only from like joint to joint, like here, you can see there's a curve kind of going this way. That's good. That's better than a straight line. But look at the other arm. The other arm, we have a straight line and it's because forms are stacked, right? It's like, uh, like the world's ultimate pool table shot, <laughs> right? All the balls in a perfect straight line. It's going to be an easy shot for me to make. I don't want that. Right? I don't want that. That makes the challenge of getting force in there much more difficult. This drawing uh, would be more forceful if I can nudge some kind of angle into the arm. It would be so much more successful to say, hey, the elbow's over there, maybe even under this table or whatever, and then comes back up and then hits the side of the hand and then probably reverses in the fingers. So you can see now I have this going on, right? So much more dramatic. Right, it's so much more dramatic. So it gives me an angle. The angle changes in the elbow, right? I'm going this way, then I'm going this way. I'm hitting into the wrist, and then I'm going this way. Just way more drama. So this to this to this is better than this. You see? In these angles, I can bring forth force. I could say it's here, it's hitting here, it's hitting here, it's hitting here. When I look at that, I'm like, eh, I have nowhere to go. There's no angle change, right? There's nothing, there's nothing to do. So be aware of that, right? Um, on the arms, remember force is on the elbow side. So it's here and it's here. And what Axel has here is fine. I just want you to be aware that, you know, you can see that you've got the shape. It seems like you went after shape. Right. How do I know that? Well, because you can see it's shaped, right? The drawing is shaped out. It doesn't have a lot of underdrawing, doesn't have a lot of connectivity and flow, it doesn't have really much form or mass at all. So in this case, Axel shaped out the arm. So you can see the outline of like the deltoid, the bicep, the tricep, the elbow, right? The forearm muscles, right? You can see all this. And if you know, if you just stick to reality and you see those shapes, you're fine. Be aware the bicep is a smaller curve than the, what's going on on the tricep. So the silhouette does actually look like this and it's fine because this guy wins, right? The winner is over here. So that's the outside to the elbow. Over here, we have a curve and a straight and we have a long curve. This guy wins, right? That proves my point of what we were saying earlier. In the drawing arms, you want to be on that outside curve, outside curve, you see? And then that curve is going to hit into this part of the hand and the palm that we can't see. And it's going to come over like that, over the knuckles, over the knuckles, and those finger, fingers will break down like that. Right? Only thing that's really missing here that we don't know what's going on with is the head. Right now, there's an ellipse in here. Um, the 
the neck is going to respond to one of the sides, either this side or this side. My guess is in this one, it's actually responding to the larger side, the longer side, and it's going like this. And you want to get those muscles hooking down to the pit of the neck where the clavicles are, right? So now I have this hooking up to this, see? And that gives me a rhythm with the neck and head to the side of the body, which is really representing the spine in the back, okay? All right, we're doing okay on time. Any questions, Swenley, from um, the audience that I can answer? Yes, there was an interesting question that, let me scroll up here, let's see. Kevin asked, Mike, what is the best way to incorporate force in my drawings while developing my own style and not simply copy your style? What, you got something against my style? <laughs> <laughs> the hell are you talking about? Um, that's a great question, actually. Uh, you know, and it's one I used to worry about, to tell you the truth, quite a bit when I just started uh, teaching. Because I used to think the same thing. I'm like, I don't want you guys thinking my goal is to teach you my, my look, right, my style. Uh, first of all, I'm not teaching a style. I think that's the first thing to recognize. Now, we're going to look today, at the end of today's session, we're going to look at a couple of students that work that are uh, premium students at drawingcourse.com, and you'll see stylistically, there's a look that's pretty damn similar, right? Because they're learning a way to think, right? And style is thinking. I'm not really trying to teach a style. I guess I'm getting caught in my own trap here, right? I'm not really trying to teach a style. I'm trying to teach a thought. But I want you to be aware that through the thought, um, you can expand. You know, you can, you can move out. You know, having taught you know, thousands of students, um, I can tell you, I've seen students use what I teach in all different kinds of ways, you know, and, and they also decide where they want to depart from the philosophy and where they want to stick with it. Um, I, the first name that comes to my mind is James Jean, who's like this now become a really famous fine artist. And you can look up James Jean's art. And he was a student of mine. And uh, you can see that there's force in it, but you wouldn't think it looks like my work. You know, it's just like fluid characters and paintings with these really sort of beautiful palettes of pastel colors. Like how he combines them, he does these like gigantic, like, you know, 12 foot by eight foot paintings. Um, you know, so they go all the way from that to guys who, you know, work in the entertainment industry, storyboarding and so on, guys who are in comics. And, uh, you know, their style is not my style. It's more of, you know, is the body rhythmic, right? You could say, well, look at Frank Frazetta. Do, do my drawings look like Frank Frazetta's? No, not really, but there's similar approaches. There's things going on. Do my drawings look like Glenn Keane's? No, not really, but there's certain things that are similar, I would imagine, in them just because we're thinking in a similar way, you know? And you can take this to, to you know, I talk about Mike Mignola. I don't think Mike Mignola's work looks anything like mine, but yet, he's got shape in there, you know? So you can thinly slice this in so many different ways later on. I think in the beginning, you're right. There's probably gonna be a thing that happens where you're like, oh man, my art looks like, like Mike's and the teachers. Sure, I, I think that's fair to say. I think there'll be a phase where you'll have to go through that because we're teaching you a way to think. But over time, you start developing your own self and what you want to use and what you don't want to use and so on, you know, and, and we're totally open to that. Of course, I'm not looking to create an army of mics. Believe me. One, of, one, of <laughs> me, one of me is more than enough. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's great indeed. And I think like if you're learning something from someone, it's logical, like you said, for your style to look like them in the beginning. Like if you're teaching someone a fighting style, it would be odd if your fighting style at the beginning is completely different than your teacher. It's like, what's wrong yeah. here? You yeah, know, it would yeah. be wrong if you don't have similarities to your teacher. And as you master the basics, then you start developing your own voice in it. Yeah. And plus, take martial arts. You know, you may learn from me and then you may go to another teacher after you learn force and you grab something from them. Maybe there's certain artists you like and you go study them and you take stuff from them. And that's how you keep building up your personal style. You know, you're bringing things in from all over the place and you become you. I've had conversations about style with a lot of professional artists and friends as well. And it's kind of the nemesis to tell you the truth of the internet. And I'm part of that nemesis, which is 
oh, there's somebody who people like to learn from. There's certain artists that everybody likes, right? And they, they grow in popularity and then everyone tries to emulate these few five to 10 artists, let's say, right? And then that just makes everything homogenous. And I think that's a problem where before the internet, people were trapped in their own little worlds. There was more opportunity individuality. In fact, I've been having the same conversations with other friends about music. You know, it's like all of a sudden everybody sounds the same. It's like, what happened to variety? You know, it's like, you know, it's like, and, and the variety we used to have has also gotten mixed together into other things that all, then that gets homogenized, you know? It doesn't sound or feel anymore like, hey, this little group in Seattle that's been playing in their garage for the last five years together has separated themselves from the world and they came out with this new sound. It seems rarer to me that that happens. So that's the negative side, I think, of the internet. But, you know, look at all the positive side, right? Like, I wouldn't be talking to you guys. You wouldn't have the chance to learn any of this stuff, right? Your learning would probably be more slowly. It might be more individual, right? But you might not really be getting skill. So you're learning skill, hopefully, from the shared experience of the internet. But I agree. I think you should be aware of your individuality in the middle of all that, too. You know, it's an interesting question. It's, a, it's kind of a tricky one. You know, I think all you can do is keep learning, keep studying, keep looking at stuff. And by the way, at some point, don't talk to anyone and don't look at anything. You know, go and sit and work, right? And just work and work and work on your own stuff so you can start developing your own opinion, you know? I think you got to do a little of both and know when to turn on the light and when to shut it off, you know, black everything else out. So, okay. Uh, you know, I think Swanley is a great example. <clears throat> you know, you think about style. Swanley, I don't design characters the same way Swanley does. He's kind of grown into his own aesthetic or aesthetics. And I don't draw characters exactly the same. They both have force in them, but my stuff doesn't look exactly like Swanley's. Or even Rotunjays. I think Rotunjays looks very different than me or Swanley as well. You know? So appreciate the question though. I think it's a really good one that I've had people ask many times. All right, so we've still got Axel here and then I have a few other students I wanna talk about. So um, when I look at this, again, one of the things with force, and I think this goes across all styles of drawing is clarity, you know, clarity of um, ideas. And when it comes to drawing models, to me, the most important thing is what's the idea of the pose? It's not just to like draw a pose. It's like, what's the idea? What are, and when I guess I say the idea, I wanna know what the doing is, right? What is happening here? Right now, I just see a body that's sitting like this with some legs sticking out like this, right? And an arm. What I don't see is how they're all connected. Right? I don't see a flow, a chain, of events that's occurring across all of it, you see? So to be really simple, right, with all of you, every shape and or part of the body from joint to joint, and we can consider the rib cage a joint and the pelvis a joint, each one of them to connect the points, you need a curve. Sometimes the curve is very strong, sometimes it's softer, if you just, plug in curves, you'd be amazed as to how fast your drawings will change at that simple level. So that's all I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna pick a curve. I'm gonna say his upper body's going this way. I want this leg going this way. I want this leg going this way. I want this going, I want this going like this into the knee and then down. I want his arm to go like this and like this, okay? So there's my game plan, right? I'm gonna knock this back and then let's draw a little bit more accurately with more, a little bit more anatomy in there. But now you've seen my map, right? So I'm gonna go in there and start drawing the figure more, more that way. So if the curve is there, this isn't important. What's important is the side where the curve would show up. It would be this side of the body, right? And that's gonna hook me up to the pelvis, right? So now I've got one bigger idea for the whole torso, it's a C torso again, notice, it's like this. Now I have this idea for the leg, so I'm gonna push this more as it's curved, get myself to the knee, and then say the cap is curved. Axel already had that there, so that worked. Here, I wanna come down from the bottom, I'm gonna sweep up into the edge of the knee, and then here, notice right now it's symmetrical, there's a bump there, there's a bump there, I could put a line right through the mirror, middle, it mirrors itself, right? 
if I don't want that, what I want is this to lead into this, right? So this goes up and over and back down and then into the heel and then the top of the foot into the ball of the foot, right? And then this arm, if I can just get this to go like this, right? Then I can add anatomy. It's a deltoid, tricep, elbow, forearm, muscles, the whole nine yards, right? But look at the difference now between this and this. I didn't change that much, right? I'm drawing right on top of Axel's drawing, but the clarity of those curves and pushing them in there, making decisions from one location to another, dramatically changes the drawing. Because the curves, you know, the curves in the end, they're gonna either keep curving, like this is one really long idea that I broke into three, or at some point, again, they're going to flip. And at the flip, you have rhythm, right? This is a rhythm, I came from here, I flipped over. I did not flip over here. This is actually one long idea, right? If I oversimplify, this is the leg. It's just that there's a knee in it, right? But it's an outside, it's an outside, it's a long idea. So you could actually say that we're getting from the ankle, and I'll draw in red, we're getting from the ankle up and over and down and connecting into the pelvis. You see, so there's a rhythm right there. And then this is one idea. So that's all I did. Right. And all of a sudden we have a figure that now is connected and, and moving. Right. Okay. Let's see what we got next. All right. This was Alessandro, I believe. Uh, let's see. It says, I have the issue of working this dirty. And it's confusing, I guess, is what you're saying. Personally, I much prefer dirty than clean. <laughs> believe it or not. Um, I'd rather have somebody draw dirty than clean so much better, especially at the beginning, because I think you learn, you know, you learn by playing in the sandbox, not by standing outside of it and raking it nice and flat and neat. You want to get in there and play with the sand and the dirt and the mud and the water and build things and make things happen. So I think this is better. I think work it, you know, Alessandro, keep working it. It's fine. The way you can get rid of some of the dirtiness, but yet, um, do the work is what we call soft touch, right? No, this is not a new skincare line that I'm inventing. <laughs> this is a way of drawing. All it means is um, you're going to start more gently, you know, and then build up your line. Not only is this, you know, not only do you learn line control out of this, right? Because you learn how to draw lightly and darkly. But you build up your ability to converse, to have richer conversation, because now we're like, oh, there's a lot of force going there. I can tell that because it's darker, right? We just talked about that last week. The rib cage is probably sticking out here. So I want to put more pressure on that, right? So do the light to dark, right? I think it was Swenley last week that did the portion on soft touch and how that affects line leads, right? Don't go in there with. Pencils that are too dark for you too fast. You know, find the graphite that will work for you that allow you to soft touch successfully. Okay? So that's how you can stay dirty um, and sort of organized at the same time. Okay. Not bad though. You got some good stuff going on here. You got this going on, you got this, this. Someone like Alessandro will have the ability to learn faster than somebody who comes in neat. Because neatness usually also comes with fear, right? Neatness and fear kind of go hand in hand because neatness comes from more of a perfectionist mentality. And that perfectionist mentality breeds concern and fear when you try to get dirty, right? And then it stops you from, from working, right? You don't want you to stop from working, I want you to work. This one I think says without reference. So I have to say pretty damn good drawing to not have reference, right? You've got a lot of perspective going on. Um, you know, when I, when I look at this, everyone, I see this, right? I'm like, oh, look at the box. Like, there it is. The arm doesn't have clear direction in space. This part of the arm does. It looks like it's going away. Uh, this arm is a little confusing. I know it's just silhouette and all. These legs look like they're going down and this is coming out. So it's in good form. I don't know how forceful I would say this is. <laughs> I think the tricky part with this one is 
to try and get more function out of it, right? So let's see if we can do that real fast here. Okay, go black. So this model is pushing up from this arm. So this part of the back is probably pushing up in response to that, right? You see, I'm drawing from what's happening. From this pushing up in the spine and that side of the body, my guess is the stomach would fall here. See, this shoulder's hanging down more, right? So it's probably like this. Let's put some form line in here. This could straighten out in the ribs here, but I'm gonna drop, I'm gonna go high here and low here. Right? I want the pelvis edge here. This leg's getting a little hot dogish, right? A little sausage -y. So I know that this leg, I'm gonna go front to front, which means if I'm gonna push any kind of straight in here, here's the rear end that goes over the leg. I would push this like this and then the curve and more of a straight. Uh, this one, this one might actually be an outside, inside, outside. I might be able to grab that in there and then push the leg like this. This means this would be straight in here. I want to push that curve there. Right? So I'm working off of function. Function is allowing me to figure out how to draw this. I want the perspective of the hand going the same way as the body. So I'm blocking the hand out more that way. Right? And then this arm is hanging. Right? And then you got the back hanging to the neck and head. So there's like my rough, right? My rough sketch of this. Let's put that together with the overlay and then see. See, I'm, I'm sketching this out, like I said, based on how I think it's working. If I were drawing this from imagination, I would do it based on function. Right? I'm trying to figure out what the model is doing to get to this place, okay? All right, last one. This is Alessandro's as well. So. Wow, right, look at the change. This is from reference and the videos on the, I'm guessing on the website, right? I think I remember this drawing. So just by Alessandro kind of going probably step-by-step step with me through a drawing, look at the dramatic change that occurred from the drawings we just looked at as to how he's getting this fluidity out of the body, improving his line, starting to see how um, these lines create rhythm, right? We're, we're connecting the links, right? The links are starting to come together. What I love in this one is this full thrust of this, right? It's like a giant crossbow, right? It's, or a bow, right? Like this one this way, and this here is the pull. It's like I could put a string here, right? And then put the arrow right in there, you see? I use metaphors all the time, as you guys know, when I'm drawing. So I see that because it helps me understand the physics and tension of how things are working, right? This leg is very stiff and coming down. We've got front to back over here and over the top of the foot. We want to connect those curves, right? Remember the, the flip. The flip is what creates rhythm. And I think Alessandro is doing a pretty good job of trying to flow through this. This is a better drawing tool for you. We just talked about tools and doing soft touch. Look at all the soft touch of them, right? Like, look at all the work Alessandro's doing in here all of a sudden. Very different, you know, and more control of the tool that builds up to solutions, right? So, yeah, good job, right? It's pretty darn good drawing. There's a lot of good stuff going on in here. All right, so I'm going to pass the ball over to Swenley, and then I'll pick up um, to close off today's meeting. So it's all yours, Swenley. I think I have to give you, hold on a second, give you power. Uh, yes. Let's see here. More co hosts. Co hosts. Okay, all yours. All right. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Let's see. So we're in Clip Studio. All right. So the first artist here is Mimosa. And I think Mimosa shows up uh, a lot in the live streams, if I'm correct. The name seems familiar. Let's zoom in a little bit here. So this is pretty good. So this is from the model and this is your attempt at exaggerating the action. Okay, let's see. So pretty good, nice line work. Your attempt to some sculpting here, especially here in the, at the back, I think it's very successful. You know, I can see the, uh, oops. I can see the roundness, you know, the way you're sculpting it and 
there is a clear turning edge going on here, like the box form, like Mike mentioned earlier. So great job on that. Let's see on this one. Like first of all, we want the forces to be clear, and I think you did a great job here. Actually, let me reduce the opacity a bit more. So this looks indeed like a C curve. You know, there's a stretch and compression going on here. You most likely would see the skin like wrapping around, you know, from all the compression that's going on. And the key thing I want to talk about here is clarity, you know, because you're trying to go for a quote unquote finish. No, nothing wrong with that. Just make sure that the drawing remains clear, you know. So things like the center line, you know, the spine at the back, that helps a lot. You know, you also want to find uh, the top of the pelvis. You know, and I'm going to construct a bit more here just to show you what I mean. And you want to understand how do the thighs fit into that uh, pelvis structure, you know, and as you know, I like to use the uh, underpants analogy, you know, so let's say this is the top of the pelvis, you have the V-shape towards the crotch area, you know, let's say this is the bottom, you know, simple pelvis shape here. And if you think of like classic underpants, they have these sockets on the sides because the thighs have to fit in, right? So you want to think about these sockets uh, structure wise when you're drawing the thighs, you know, so the thigh would pop out of this socket. And if you start like lifting your thigh towards the pit of the arms, for example, you know, you have to keep in mind again, the socket on the farther side and how the volume of the thigh fits in that, you know, like this is the, uh, the joint, you know, where it rotates. So you want to keep that, uh, like the structure ideas in mind when you're refining the drawing. Now, so this is pretty good. Again, uh, this seems like a front to front. Also, I would clarify that here, the ankle, it starts getting a bit too symmetrical. So uh, keep the uh, drawing again clear in terms of where's the foresight, you know, and I can feel all the applied force on this heel, you know, so this would be like pushing out and being squashed on that ground plane. You know? so you want to get those ideas in the drawing that's what makes the drawing interesting you know it's uh, the ideas are storytelling you know you're telling us something rather than just trying to copy or you know finish a drawing for the sake of calling it finished also make sure that it's clear which side is driving the force and form wise you know like you want forceful form. So if we have a, a tube, for example, let's say we have a simple cylinder here. You know, so we want to add force to it. So it has a feeling of movement and direction. So in order to do that, we have to bend that cylinder. You know, and uh, in bending it, we don't want again, this like pipe or sausage kind of shape where it's still symmetrical. We want that asymmetry, you know, to give it a sense of direction and movement. So I put a lesser curve on this side, you know, to create that. And inevitably the outside edge of this forceful cylinder is a force shape. You know, so this is how force shape comes into being in the figure, you know, it's, a, it's the outside edge of a forceful form. So the problem occurs when you start using shapes without um, creating it from a force and form standpoint, you know, then the shape becomes flat and uh, disconnected from the rest of the body. Okay, same here. So here I would definitely like think 
through and try to figure out, okay, if I'm seeing that knee sticking out here under the pelvis, like what's happening with that thigh? You know, I want to always know and understand what's going on. That's the difference between analyzing and copying. You know, so same here, we have the directional force at the back, I put a lesser curve here. And as I'm drawing that, I'm thinking about this. You know, so this has form to it. So I can use wrapping lines. I like to use them at the joints, you know, just to be more efficient. So we don't have to put a thousand wrapping lines over the whole body, but just put that at the joints. So this is back of calf and connects to the arc of the foot. Again, there's a lot of uh, weight here that's being squashed. So you want to make this darker, you know, to show the weight on that. And you have the directional force of the heel, you know, and now I created this shape here, but I want form. So I'm thinking about this roundness. You know, if you look at the bottom of the foot, you can all often see this uh, clear plane at the heel. You know, and want to continue that by adding this turning edge going underneath the foots and creating this plane. You know, so now I have force, form, and shape working together. So you can always also like wrap around here to create some form. So this is great. I like how we saw this connection. So force is coming from the back all the way into this arm right here, you know, and again, in this arm, you want clarity, you know, like how is the arm working? If I look at the arm right now, it's pretty much like bumpy all over the place. I want to simplify it and clarify it. Actually, let me draw it on a new layer so it's even clearer. So force is coming here, connecting us into that deltoid. You know, it seems like the elbow is facing this way, which means that the force would be on this side. You know, and again, you can create a simple forceful cylinder for the arm all the way to the wrist and a wrapping line here to show the volume. You know, this would be, this would overlap at the deltoid. And then I have to figure out once I reach the wrist, is the hands a continuation of that force line or do we flip to the other side and create a rhythm like Mike talked about earlier? You know, let me see. Judging from your drawing, it seems like we go to the other side and get a rhythm, which then connects us into the fingers. You know, this would be going this way. So the palm again, forceful cylinder at the wrapping line here clear foresight, lesser curve on the other side, wrapping line to give me volume. And then I have to figure out where's the force curve of each finger. So these are being compressed against that ground plane. And once you have this forceful cylinder to work with, you know, the elbow joint would be around here, then you can start building. You know, here's where anatomy knowledge comes in now the shoulder blades, always an important bony landmark at the back. Now then you have the deltoids like fitting here, attaches on the side plane on, uh, of the arm. You know, then you can add the elbow, you can add the forearm muscles on top. You know, so then you start building and you want to keep the clarity. You know, so I think what you did here again, this was a good attempts, just it's clear. And the way to do that is first of all, find the force. And then from that uh, directional force, you want to turn that into a simple forceful cylinder, or it can even be a forceful box for the arm. And then you build on top, you know, and attempt to maintain that clarity as you go. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. So same here for the hair. Like if I look at the head and the hair, this looks like a simple egg shape, you know, and you want more going on. Like, first of all, figure out like, how is this working? Now it's force coming from the back. This is falling down, it seems. 
you know, so you will have the head here, the bottom of the cranium here at the back. And if this head is hanging like this, then the hair would also be hanging. You know? So I want to show that, I like show how that hair is wrapping around on the head volume and like falling down, you know, and again, clarify the story you know this makes it more interesting than just trying to draw like all the details you know create those details from a story point of view you know so this is being pulled down by gravity okay let's see so this is an attempt at exaggeration so pretty good. I like how you started to push the size difference between the feet here. So if we add a bounding box here and a bounding box here, you know, you can see the difference. It gets smaller as it goes away, with, which creates like the greater the size difference, the more the exaggerated the feeling of depth is, you know, and this is coming towards us. So yeah, again, pretty good attempts. You know, I would just um, keep the same clarity here, like start with that simple, like C, uh, C curved torso, you know, there's a clear stretch at the back and this is compressing. You know, this is great, by the way, I can see a clear turning edge here, center line. So you want to bring that over all the way up here you know, and keep the structure in mind. How do all these parts fit into each other? You know, like things start feeling a bit detached once they reach here. So you want to keep the top plane of the torso in mind, you know, and the neck of course is an extension of the spine. So this would go from here to here. This head is falling. You know, make sure that the neck is actually centered on that torso. So the placement of your lines make structural sense. Also force is coming from the back into the deltoids. You know, and you can push the, uh, the arm. Now we can push that even more. And I wonder if it's coming towards us more than you know, the wrapping is the change. I have to show that you know, this is coming towards us. You know, go into that hand and into the fingers again. You know, keep the shoulder blade in mind again, super important anatomical landmark at the back, you know, the arms attached to it. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. So this looks good. I like how you uh, like brought the thigh underneath the uh, upper torso here. And sculpting wise, again, sculpts to like reinforce the idea, you know? So I would sculpt, actually let me change colors here. I would sculpt to help me show the action you know, so I would sculpt like this. You know, this is the direction that force is flowing in. So sculpt like this, you know, go over the deltoids. This is, I want to show like the speeds and energy as that arm is coming towards us, you know, falling down over the palm of the hand into the fingers. You know, this is going around. I would show like the, the side plane here of that pelvis box. And like function wise, again, you're showing us that that thigh is going underneath his torso. So I would sculpt, you know, I would sculpt in that direction to show like the speed and energy with which that's happening. Same here, this is coming towards us. So I would sculpt in this direction to show that now, then you go over and underneath. You know, so let the sculpting be uh, an extension of the directional forces, you know, which helps you 
reinforce the action, you know, like here, force is going from the back and it's falling down. So I would sculpt here, you know, we have the top plane of the head here. So this reinforces the action. All right, are there any questions in the chat, Mike? I'm muted. Uh, no, everything's good. I'm, I'm fielding all the questions. <laughs> yeah, you're all good. Okay. Uh, again, this is pretty good drawing. Let me see because I want to get to the other two guys before we end. Yeah. So I would say this is again. So force-wise, you're doing pretty good. You know, it seems like you're wanting to jump to the uh, to the anatomy a bit too fast, I would say, uh, take your time in developing forceful form first, develop a good understructure, simple underlying structure, and then build those smaller forms on top. You know, that will make it much easier and uh, make your drawing much more successful, faster. You know, like for example, here, it almost seems like you're creating a rhythm from here to here. You know, and the arms, the anatomy isn't designed like that, you know. And one example I like to bring up is a bodybuilder's arm. You know, if you look at the bodybuilder's arm, like flexing their biceps, you know, you would see that the triceps is the like longer, more forceful curve of the body. And the biceps is this tiny little bump here, you know. And of course, with a bodybuilder, the muscles are exaggerated but the design of the arm doesn't change once the arm gets uh once you have like a more slender built arm you know it's still the same you know so this curve here needs to be much more dominant you know, especially considering that you know, force coming from the back into that shoulder and then sweeping down here so you want this to this first biceps i would start with a lesser curve you know, it creates a forceful cylinder same here you know notice how this cylinder has a clear sense of direction to it which then connects also the arm so uh, the palm of the hand i mean so i once i have the force i can use wrapping line lesser curve on the other sides then I have a forceful form that works with the rhythms, you know, so the fingers seems like he's like holding or resting his hand on his calf here. You know, so once I have this, you know, and be aware of the volume at the top of the shoulder as well. You know, I often see students forget that. Also, you have the clavicle, let's say the pit of the neck is around here. You have the clavicle, which is like this bicycle handle that's connecting all the way back here to the shoulder blades, you know, and the deltoid, the shoulder connects to the shoulder blade at the back and the clavicle at the front, you know, so you have this wrapping around that's going on, you know, so you always have this plane that's being created at top of the shoulder. So let's add a turning edge here. So this is the front of the arm, the deltoid would attach like halfway at that side plane and connect here to the clavicle. Now, and once you have this simple understructure, then it's easy if you know your anatomy, you can come in and start like refining those muscles, you know, and you can even add like the biceps here, but just make sure that you don't mirror the curve, you know, and start creating these uh, uh, like uh, sausage kind of shapes, you know, because again, the human body isn't designed like that. It's more asymmetrical and rhythmical. You know, same here, clear force curve, you know, use wrapping lines at the joints to create this forceful cylinder, and then you can build on top all right 
I hope this helps, uh, Mimosa. Looking forward to, I think I've also seen this on Instagram. So I look forward to how you continue improving with your drawings and drawing with force. All right, let's see. This is from Jilsha. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. So pretty good drawing, like uh, very fluid. You know, it has a lot of personality and character to it. So fantastic job on that. Um, here I would say with the arm, uh, again, even for uh, a person that is like, has like a heavier built arm, you still want the simplicity of that underlying uh, cylinder. You now think about the volume here at the wrist. And here I would add an overlap, you know, because you have this, these muscles here on the side, which wrap around. You know, so you want to keep the overlap clear there. And then at the front, I have to think about those forces. You now, so forces coming from the back into that shoulder. You now, this would be the straighter moment because the curve is at the back. We have the elbow sticking out, a bit of form going on here. You know, so again, once I design this front part, I want to make sure that I don't mirror this curve here. So sometimes you just have to take a bit of artistic license and do some designing, you know, especially once you start closing the shapes, like the drawing is your drawing and you should always aim to make your drawing clearer than the photo, you know, like the drawing is your responsibility. So if the photo or the model, you know, if you're seeing some unclarities, you want to bring, it's your job to bring clarity to that. Let's see, so this looks good. Oh, this is also good, very fluid. Like I like the rhythm that's from the arm into this, into that finger. Uh, great job on that. And same here, like I would push the functionality a little bit. So perhaps make this a bit of a straighter moment. You know, so we have this rhythm from here to here, much clearer. So this going all the way around and connecting here. Uh, thighs work pretty well. Again, super fluid line work. Great job on that. Good sense of form, like just the placement of this belly button here you know, is giving us the roundness that's going on here. And this, I would push the forms a bit more, like really let it like wrap around you know, and show like the weight. You know, this gives us like this extra layer of form here. And make sure that the head and neck also remained rhythmic and fluid. So this force would come from the spine into that face. You know, so you want to keep the fluidity of the figure going in the head and neck as well. All right, it's almost time. So let's see. This is from Datshana. Okay, very loose drawing, which is good. I would say just keep in mind the clarity. I don't know how big these are. It seems like you are working relatively small, you know, but same as I showed the, uh, the other artists, uh, you want to keep the drawing clear, you know, and don't jump into details too fast. Build your way towards that uh, step by step, you know. So here, for example, you want a clear torso mass to start with. You have a clear stretch and compression going on here. You now you want to figure out like where is the top of the pelvis, that V shape for the crotch. Think about the, again, underpants shape and how the thighs fits into that. Now add a center line. Now use the uh, forceful cylinders for the arms. So you can't, uh, you can't keep working as loose as you're doing now. You just want it to be clearer, you know, and more efficient in how you communicate the action. 
All right, I'm going to give it over to Mike so we can close. All right, thank you, Swanley. Yes, you're welcome. All right, guys, so um, in closing, I just wanted to show you a couple of students uh, from the website that submitted uh, some work. Uh, so here we have Ricardo's. Um, I'm sending, I'm showing you this because I just want you to see, uh, you know, how all the stuff that Swanley and Matinje, I mean, and Swanley and I talked about today um, start coming together in the work, right? The, the value of the line starts meaning something. Uh, the figures start to connect themselves to one another. Um, you know, you get a more holistic drawing. And, you know, a lot of the drawing is still not there, right? Because uh, when it comes to priority and timing, and sometimes just purely where a student is on their path to learning how to draw a force, we don't need those things yet, right? The most important thing is to understand how the whole body is working, right? So these beautiful drawings by Ricardo. And then there's a bunch here by Suman as well. One of the things, again, we believe in at course.com is iteration, right? Doing things over and over again to really improve and understand them. Uh, so what an awesome job, right? Look at all the push he's getting into the right shoulder, um, all the fluidity into the hip. Right, so you have this uh, contradiction of two different directions occurring between the right shoulder and left pelvis, and then all the beautiful fluidity uh, going down into the legs, right? Just really nice. Great line. Remember, line is your language, so you want to be able to control it. Doesn't mean you have to be neat about it, right? We started today talking about our neatness and all that. And you can see these are not neat, but they're soft touch. So there's a lot of work in the drawings that gives Suman the opportunity to think through the problems to get to this place, right? So if you like what you see here, um, you know, this is what we're teaching at the website, come visit us. Uh, there are some questions today about pricing and all like all the stuff's on the website. You can always email me or Swenly, it's just mike at drawingforce.com or swenly at drawingforce.com. Um, and we're more than happy to answer your questions, okay? Hope you guys enjoyed uh, today's Force Friday. Uh, next week, we'll be here again with some other uh, fun topic to uh, try to help you guys learn how to draw better, see better, and think better. Um, and that's it. Have a great, um, happy, exciting, safe weekend. If you're on the, on the West Coast where I am, try to have a cool weekend. It's a pretty darn hot uh, weekend that's coming in. Uh, otherwise, we will see you uh, next Friday. Take care. And thanks again, Swimmy. Yes. Take care, Mike. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys.